Welcome to the deep dive. You know, in today's tech world, it feels like we're just constantly swimming in information, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Just bombarded. Yeah. And trying to figure out, you know, what's actually innovative versus what's just, well, hype. And what might really change things for us digitally. It's tough cutting through that noise. It really is. We're all kind of looking for that shortcut, right? To get past the buzzwords and um, really understand the core ideas that matter. Exactly. And that's really our mission for this deep dive. We're going to get into something pretty fascinating. The Internet Computer Protocol, or ICP. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just about understanding some cutting edge tech, though it is that. It's also about pulling out, you know, universal lessons. How do these big, ambitious technologies actually fare in the real world? How do they succeed? Or sometimes why do they hit major roadblocks? Yeah, our goal is really to dissect the main innovations here, look at the practical uses, and also be uh, pretty candid about the challenges. Yeah. Do any project trying to shake things up faces them. And we've pulled from, well, a whole range of sources, official reports, academic stuff, but also like real talk from places like Reddit, Industry Takes. Yeah. Trying to get that full picture of what's happening at the uh, the bleeding edge here. Okay, so let's jump right in. Let's unpack the big vision first. Yeah. What is ICP fundamentally? Our sources say it's not a company. Right, not a company. It's a protocol. Mm -hmm. Think of it like um, a set of rules for a decentralized open network of computers all over the world. Okay. And the ambition is huge. They talk about it becoming a single computer spread across an internet-like network. Wow. Okay. So less like a service you buy, more like a foundational layer for the web itself. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Like a global operating system almost. Yeah. Anyone can join run computations. The idea is this world computer that can host web services directly. A world computer. And central to this are these things called canisters. What exactly are canisters? Why are they so important here? Okay. So think smart contracts, but like on steroids. Uh, Canisters are described as uh, general purpose, tamper-proof, and autonomous programs. Mm. But they're not just for simple transactions. The really key thing is they can host full web services. Mm. They can even serve web pages right to users. Directly. So that could massively simplify things for developers. Right? Actually, yeah. yeah. Streamline development, deployment. It's a different way of building. But here's something that sounds really impactful for, well, for you listening, this reverse gas model. Oh, yeah. We all know about paying gas fees on blockchains, right? Annoying little charges. Ugh. ICP apparently flips that around. It does completely. Yeah. Normally, you, the user, pay for every little interaction. With ICP's reverse gas model, the developers preload their apps with something called cycles. Cycles. Yeah. Like fuel for the app. Exactly. Computation fuel. Yeah. And the big benefit for you, the user, no transaction fees. Zero. Wow which makes dApps way more accessible, right? Suddenly, things involving lots of small transactions become actually viable. It lowers that barrier to entry massively. No user transaction fees. That's genuinely a huge deal for adoption. Okay, and then there's this other claim that sounds pretty bold. ICP is described as nuclear bomb resistant. What on earth does that mean? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's definitely a strong metaphor. It is. It's meant to highlight extreme resilience. It's not just about backups. It points to this highly distributed architecture. Mm -hmm. Nodes are independent, spread out geographically. Mm. So even a massive localized disaster or, yes, maybe even an extreme attack wouldn't take down the whole system. Because it's running in so many places at once. Precisely. Applications are replicated across many independent nodes. It's built for resilience, for continuous operation. Got it. So... For you listening, understanding this is pretty key. It's not just abstract tech. It's about a potential redesign of how digital services get built. Maybe simpler for developers, cheaper for users because of no transaction fees, and built on this incredibly resilient base, a faster, cheaper, more robust internet, basically. That's the vision, yeah. Okay, let's shift gears a bit. One of the, let's be honest, major headaches in crypto right now is fragmentation. You've got all these different blockchains, kind of like isolated islands, right? Oh, absolutely. Walled gardens is the term you hear a lot. Yeah, and liquidity fragmentation. Money and activity trapped in silos that don't easily talk to each other. It's a critical problem. <laughs> For all the innovation, the ecosystem is incredibly split up. We desperately need ways for these things to interact seamlessly without needing permission from some central party. And that brings us to ICP's chain fusion. Our sources are framing this as the answer, allowing direct uh, bridge-free integration. Exactly. Bridge-free is the key phrase. Seamless interaction between blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana plan for next year too. Yeah. And the tech behind it is called chain key technology. 
instead of relying on those centralized bridges which, let's face it, have been hacked numerous times. Yeah. Chain Fusion uses advanced cryptography, things like Threshold ECDSA and Schnorr signatures. Think of them as ways for ICP to securely speak the native language of other blockchains and sign transactions directly on those chains. Without a middleman. Without a risky intermediary, yeah. It means ICP can integrate with pretty much any other blockchain, making cross-chain stuff much safer and more efficient. And this direct link has enabled things like native ICP assets, face KBTC, a Bitcoin twin. That's right. CKBTC, EKETH, ACKUSDC, CKUSDP. Uh -huh. These are direct one-to-one -one representations of those assets held securely on ICP using that chain key tech. Okay, so not just theory. What are the real-world applications? Well, let's look at Bionique. They're using chain fusion for Bitcoin ordinals, so those NFT-like things on Bitcoin. Right. They let you create, collect, trade them, but without Bitcoin's high gas fees and slow times. Okay. You get Bitcoin security, that sort of bomb-proof ledger, but with ICP speed and low cost for the actual NFT interactions. Best of both worlds, then. Making something expensive and slow much easier to use. What about uh, loca mining? Sounds interesting. Yeah, local mining is using it for decentralized Bitcoin mining services. It lets miners do things like sell contracts based on their future hashing power. Okay, like futures for mining. Kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Get cash advances, hedge against price swings, and the transactions for these contracts have, like, one-second finality with almost zero fees, opens up totally new financial tools for miners. Wow, okay. And oracles. Getting real-world data onto the blockchain is always crucial. Absolutely. Orally is a good example here. They use chain fusion to connect traditional web services with blockchain functions. They offer decentralized price feeds that's called Sybil and also cross-chain messaging, Hermes, letting apps on ICP talk to the outside world and other chains securely. Okay, this connects to something else you mentioned earlier, blockchains on blockchain. Sounds a bit like Inception. Haha, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit mind-bending, but it's a real use case. ICP can actually host other entire blockchains on his network. Seriously? Yeah. The big example was BOB, which stood for blockchain on blockchain. It was a meme coin, but it ran on ICP using its compute power. And did that work? It had a massive impact, actually. Our sources say it caused a 3,000% increase in ICP's cycle burn rate. Remember, cycles are the fuel between August and September 2024. 3,000%? Yeah. Apparently, more ICP was burned or used up in the 35 days after BOB launched than in the entire three years before that. Oh. It really showed the demand for these kinds of new applications and um, ICP's capacity to handle really high volume. That is a staggering statistic. Okay, so the big picture for you listening, Chain Fusion tackles that fragmentation problem head on. It enables new kinds of apps, lowers costs, improves the user experience. It really seems like a move away from that crypto tribalism towards a more connected Web3. That's certainly the goal, yeah. A more functional, interoperable Web3. Okay, let's dig into those fundamentals. Yeah. Security, decentralization, scalability, always key for any big digital system. How does ICP approach security differently beyond just firewalls and stuff? Well, one really interesting angle is simplicity. Building on traditional cloud setups, you know, AWS, Google Cloud, mm -hmm. It's complex. Right. Developers manage virtual private clouds, subnets, firewalls, lots of moving parts. Right, lots of places to make a mistake. Exactly. ICP aims to abstract a lot of that away. The deployment model is simpler. And the argument is this inherently leads to many fewer misconfiguration vulnerabilities. Fewer knobs to turn wrongly means fewer security holes. Simplicity as a security feature. I like that. What about phishing? That seems like a constant battle everywhere online. Yeah, so for user login, ICP has something called Internet Identity. It's pretty neat. It uses biometrics like your fingerprint or face ID and physical keys like those little YubiKeys. Okay. Crucially, it doesn't store passwords. It only stores public cryptographic keys. So if there's no password database to steal and no password for you to type in... Then you can't be phished for it. Exactly. Right. It makes authentication much more secure against that whole category of attack. That's clever. And what if a security vulnerability is found in the system itself? Getting patches rolled out everywhere consistently is a nightmare in traditional IT. Huge problem, yeah. This is where ICP's governance system, the Network Nervous System, or NNS, comes in again. The NNS. When a security fix is needed, it gets proposed to the NS. If the community votes to approve it, that fix can be automatically deployed across, get this, 100% of the nodes 
in the network. Automatically. Wow. Yeah. So vulnerabilities can be mitigated really quickly and uniformly. It's a big operational advantage compared to trying to get thousands of different entities to manually patch their systems. Definitely. Okay, let's talk decentralization and censorship resistance. The sources say dApps on ICP run with a default replication factor of 13 nodes. What does that actually mean in practice? It means your app isn't just running on one server. By default, it's running simultaneously in 13 different physical locations on nodes run by different providers. 13 copies. Essentially, yeah. So if one node goes down, or even several, your application just keeps running. It provides massive uptime and resilience against outages. It's fault tolerance built right in. Okay. And this loops back to the NNS and governance again. We see examples all the time. Platforms getting deplatformed, people getting banned from social media by centralized companies. Right. Immense power held by a few tech giants. How does ICP offer a different model? Well, with the NNS, decisions about the platform itself, usage rules, content moderation, even core protocol upgrades were supposed to be made by the community. People who stake ICP tokens in what are called neurons get to vote. So control shifts from a corporation to the token holder. That's the idea. It shifts control to a global decentralized community. If you want to say you participate in the governance, it's a move towards that ideal of a truly uncensorable internet where no single company can just decide to shut something down. Okay. And finally, scalability. Always the big challenge for blockchains wanting mass adoption, speed, and cost. Yep. ICP makes pretty strong claims here. Being fast and cheap for transactions, for data storage, able to handle high traffic. And is there evidence it's delivering? Well, the network activity growth is pretty impressive. Our sources cite a 150% increase in the last year and developer adoption up 30%, even while the broader crypto market was kind of slow. That suggests it is making progress on handling more load efficiently and attracting builders. So putting it all together for you listening, understanding these deeper architectural choices, the security model, the replication, the NNS governance, the scalability efforts, helps you judge which platforms might actually deliver on that Web3 promise of a more robust, secure, decentralized digital future. It's about how they're built. Exactly, it helps you see beyond the marketing claims. Right, now we've talked up the vision, the tech, but let's get real for a moment. Groundbreaking tech doesn't guarantee success. There are always hurdles. We can even look at something like uh, NFT tickets for events. Oh, it's a great example. Right. The idea had cool features, counterfeit proof tickets, artists getting resale royalties. It sounds great on paper. Totally. Yeah. But they didn't really take off, did they? Not widely, no. And a big reason was user friction. Making people get a crypto wallet, understand gas fees maybe, just for a concert ticket. It was too much hassle. Yeah, too complicated. And then you had things like the FTX collapse, creating broader trust issues, which didn't help. Remember when even Coachella NFTs became inaccessible for a bit? Oh, yeah. It just shows that even brilliant tech has to be easy and trustworthy for people to actually use it. Absolutely. User experience is king. So applying that lesson, even for a project as ambitious as ICP, what kinds of real-world adoption barriers and criticisms have come up? Well, like any big tech push, it faces those classic technology adoption barriers, tech hurdles, financial questions, organizational challenges, even just psychological resistance to change. And ICP hasn't been immune. No, definitely not. And you see pretty frank discussions about this stuff on places like the Definity Forums, which is, you know, healthy. What kinds of things are discussed? Well, there have been ongoing debates about perceived centralization. Critics might point to the early distribution of NNS voting power or the role of the Definity Foundation, although the network aims for increasing decentralization over time. Okay. There have also been accusations um, like claims of fake growth or suggestions that cycle burn rates were maybe artificially ramped up early on to help onboard node providers. Yeah. We also saw mentions in some discussions alleging SBF manipulation, mm. Sam Bankman Freed possibly impacting its initial price, though that's more market speculation than a tech critique. Right, market factors versus the tech itself. And just the general critique you sometimes hear is it trying to solve all the world's problems in one blockchain? Could that lead to it being spread too thin or becoming overly complex? Interesting. And you mentioned how some projects building on ICP have navigated this. Yeah, this was quite telling. A project called DOLRAI apparently made a conscious decision to kind of abstract the IC, meaning not heavily feature ICP itself in their white paper. Why would they do that? To appeal more broadly, especially to investors who are maybe more chain-focused, yeah. focused on the base layer like Ethereum or Solana, or to make getting listed on big centralized exchanges easier. 
Apparently, there's a perception that platforms dominate exchange listings, not specific apps. So kind of downplaying the specific tech to fit market expectations. It highlights that tension, right, between a pure decentralized vision and the practicalities of how markets and investors actually work right now. Absolutely. So the takeaway for you here is that understanding these critiques and challenges gives you that crucial, well-rounded view. Even the most innovative tech faces real obstacles. Success isn't just about having cool features. It's about user experience, market navigation, building trust. It's the whole package. Yeah, the best tech doesn't always win if it can't cross those real-world hurdles. Mm. Okay, so let's wrap this up. We've taken a pretty deep dive today into the Internet Computer Protocol. We looked at that huge ambition, the world computer idea. Mm -hmm. We explored the innovative chain fusion tech aiming to connect blockchains without those risky bridges. And its unique approaches to some core challenges security through simplicity, decentralization via replication, and the NNS and its scalability efforts. All right. Understanding these pieces really gives you, we hope, a clearer view of how Web3 is evolving. It's all about trying to build a digital foundation that's potentially more resilient, more secure, more accessible. Pushing the limits of what a decentralized internet could actually look like. So here's a final thought to leave you with. As projects like ICP push these boundaries, enabling apps to run across chains, aiming for systems without central control points, what does that really mean for things like digital ownership, for our privacy, for the whole idea of censorship online? Yeah, it's a big question. This drive for a truly uncensorable internet forces us to confront some really complex issues around decentralized governance. Who makes the rules? Who's ultimately responsible when you have a global shared digital commons like this? Definitely something to think about. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive.